the titled aristocracy of the scum of the earth. You always say titled aristocrats. What about untitled aristocrats? Well, I could hardly despise them, could I? That would be self-hatred, and that's unhealthy. Welcome to Your Pick, a film podcast. I'm Geneva. And I'm Tatum. We are two friends who love movies and love sharing them with each other. Each week, we take turns picking a film that is close to our hearts and talk about why it moves us, to tears, to laughter, and everything in between. We celebrate the craft of filmmaking, as well as the unique and personal ways we find meaning in the movies we watch. Merry Christmas, Tatum. Thank you. Uh, Merry day after Christmas to you as well and our listener. Thank you very much. I hope everybody had a... Did you say listener? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm addressing the listener. I hope they had a... Oh, okay. They had a merry... I thought you meant that we only have one listener. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, who knows? It's the day after Christmas. We might only have one listener for this episode. <laughs> um, but whoever you are, I hope you had a... Thank you. We appreciate your, uh, yeah. your ears. Hopefully you survive the holidays. I don't know... If you guys have pleasant holidays or stressful holidays, but either way, hopefully you survived and you had a good day and, uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All in the holiday spirit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to tell the listener or listeners <laughs> what you've been watching recently? <laughs> is this just, I feel like this is just going to be an ongoing gag at this point. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I um I haven't really been watching that many movies because it's been a busy a busy week. Um, you know, holiday season, lots of things going on. Um, but so I have watched some TV shows though. Um, so for our last episode, I think it was I think it was before our last episode, Carol. There was a show that I watched that wait. Now I'm forgetting. Geneva, did I talk about everything now? When we... Um, that does not sound familiar. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure I didn't already talk about it because I forget when I watched it. Unless you did and I'm just forgetting the name. I don't think I talked about it. Um, okay. Anyway. Um, so yeah, I actually watched a TV show before our Carol episode, but I forgot to mention it um, on that one. And this show is called Everything Now. Um, it is a Netflix original show. I think it might be a limited series. I'm not entirely sure. It's one of those shows where it ends and you're like, I feel like because it's Netflix, they might give it another season, but I don't really think that it's necessary. <laughs> Netflix. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's the first Netflix original show I've watched in a while. I'm not particularly uh, into a lot of the vibes of the Netflix original shows at this point. Um, but I discovered this one because it, I was just doing some research online for like queer shows that are, uh, a, a little bit up my alley is the way that I'll phrase it. <laughs> um, and so I read the description for this one. I was like, oh, it sounds interesting. I'll check it out. And so the premise of it is that, um, so the premise of it is it, the main character is this girl who is in high school. And um, this isn't a spoiler. We find out, like, basically first off in the first episode. But she has um, an eating disorder. And so she is basically coming out of, I don't know, a nine-month uh, treatment. Um, like, she was, she was in a treatment center for nine months. And so she's coming out and she's realizing that, you know, in her teenage years, you know, time moves a lot faster when you're in high school. Um and so she comes out of this treatment and she realizes that all of her friends have done all of these things that she hasn't done. So she starts talking with them and they're talking about how like, oh yeah, I dated this person and I had sex with this person and I tried drugs and I, you know, met this new person and blah, blah, blah. And she's just like, whoa, wait, what? All of you have done these things and I've just been in a center? Like, oh my gosh, I feel like I need to catch up and make up for lost time. And so... That's why it's called Everything Now. She's like, I need to do everything now, uh, which for me in a lot of ways is very relatable. Um, and so she basically like writes this list of all of these things that she wants to do, whether it's like drugs, skipping school, first date, like all of these different things. And um, her first like week out of her treatment, 
she's like, okay, we got to go to this party this weekend. And she has all of this like bravery and courage of, okay, I'm going to go do this thing. And she goes with her friends and it ends up being not the best experience because she's trying to do everything in one night. And her friends are like, what is this list? You want to do all of this in one night? Like, no. (laughs) And so the rest of the show kind of rolls from there in terms of she starts to realize, okay, some of these things I want to do, some of these things I might not want to do. And what's the pace at which I want to do them? What if there's other things I want to add to this list that I'm actually wanting to do that, you know, other, you know, so it's really good. And then we learn more about her friends and, you know, what they've been doing and why they've been doing it. And, you know, there's a lot of high school drama between friend groups of people. Um, But it's really, really good. Um, As far as high school shows go, I found it very engaging. Um, I didn't feel like it was, it it didn't make me feel gross because sometimes there's high school shows and it's like, I don't, I feel awkward as a grown adult watching children. Like, why is this okay that we're watching children do the, like, I don't, ugh. But this show doesn't go um, too far in that direction. Um, It's a really good show. And the friend group is very endearing. I like their dynamic. It's extremely racially diverse. It's very, um, it's very queer, but also not in a way that's like, because some, some queer high school shows, you watch them and you're like, this isn't realistic. I don't think life is like this anywhere. This is a fantasy land. Whereas this one, um, it's still not entirely realistic, but it feels more real. So anyway, that's everything now. Um, I would recommend it. It's a good show. Um, it's, I think there were only maximum 10 episodes and they weren't very long. Um, okay. The way you're describing it, it's, I feel like I'm kind of surprised that it's a show rather than a movie, but then I guess it kind of is the thing to like, you just take a present pre- premise and make it into a, a mini series. Yeah, it, but it sounds like an interesting premise. Yeah, it doesn't feel over long. I mean, we have different episodes where we kind of focus on different characters because the friend group has like five people in it. And so you'll have one episode where you focus on one. There's an episode where you focus on the main character's brother and like what it's like to be the sibling of someone who, you know, so it's not just, it's very, it, it involves a lot of like, the realities and the struggles of having an eating disorder and why and the, just the struggle of it. And so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good show. Um, mm, interesting. That sounds cool. I hope there is not a second season because <laughs> then it's just gonna, I don't, yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. And then I actually watched another Netflix original show, Um, but this is one that is, it's a Mexican show. It's in Spanish and it's called, um, Madre Solo Hay Dos or what was the title in English? Um, I think the title in English is like mother of a, or daughter of another mother or I don't know. It's not a direct translation, so I don't remember what the English translation is, but it's something like mother of a daughter, daughter of another mother or something like that. Um, But I was looking up something that is in Spanish so I could just like kind of stay fresh. I want to watch a lot more Spanish language things. And the premise of this is there are two women. One of them is, I think she's in college and um, she kind of like, she got pregnant, but it was not planned. And then this other one is this older woman who's probably in her early 40s who's like this businesswoman who has everything together. And she's like, I am having a child to prove that I can be a good and present mother, but also still have my career. But also I recognize that I spent too much time at my career, you know? And so the two of them basically like their, their beds are next to each other in the hospital while they're giving birth. And then (laughs) there's this poor, uh, I don't know. I'm assuming it's a nurse, but in the, um, like the NICU or whatever you call it, where like the babies go or the nursery. I don't know the technical terms. I don't think it's NICU because the children aren't dying. So I think it's just the nursery. Um, But there's this nurse who's like, she realizes that she took the identifying tags off of the babies. And so she doesn't know which baby is which baby. (laughs) And so she basically just does eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and then puts whatever tag on whichever baby 
And so the two moms, they end up taking their children home and they have them for a few weeks and they really end up bonding with them. And then it might even be a few months. I don't remember. But basically, like, they have them at their home long enough for them to really establish, like, a bonding relationship with this child. And then they find out that it's, like, not their biological child. And so the two of them are like, okay, I guess we'll just give each other's babies back. But it's really hard for them because they've spent these really bonding months with these children. And um, and so basically they end up deciding that the younger mother is going to move into the home of the older mother and they'll have the two kids together in the same home and they'll like co-parent together. And the older mother, you know, she's, she's married. She's got two kids. They have this huge mansion house because they're very like established and the younger mother doesn't really have anything. And so, um, it's, it's a good show. It's, um, it's very funny. I didn't recognize that it was a comedy going in, but then I started watching it. I was like, this is actually really funny. Um, and the Spanish is like very easy to understand, which is nice. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know how many of our listeners are Spanish speakers, but even if you're not, you could always watch with subtitles. Um, it's a good time if you just want to like put something on and watch that's like funny. So, um, I love the idea of that premise. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's a good show. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's three seasons, um, and like, that's it. I I haven't finished season one, but I've liked it so far. Um, and then lastly, I've just continued watching Reservation Dogs. So I, I'm not going to keep telling people to watch it, but you should watch it. It's very good. Okay, that's it. The end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Um, I've watched quite a few new movies um, this week, so I'll just kind of go through them pretty quickly. Um, I watched The Stranger, which is directed by Orson Welles. That is about, it, it came out right after 1946, right after World War II ended. And it's about this fear that what if a Nazi has found a way to hide in plain sight in, within a sort of small town Americana? He's just married this woman. He's a respected teacher in the town. And so the, um, uh, like a, I guess not FBI agent, but some sort of um, government official comes into town and he knows that there's a Nazi hiding out there somehow, but he doesn't know who it is. And so he's trying to to ferret him out. And then once he realizes who it is, trying to convince um, the, the man's new wife and everyone else in the town of who he is and, um, yeah, arrest him. Um, it's okay. It's It's kind of interesting. I feel like I was sort of... The first half, I kept comparing it to uh, Shadow of a Doubt, which is one of my favorite Hitchcock films, and that film is very much a similar premise of what if someone that you trust and think is normal is actually a like you know terrible murderer, but that is told from the perspective of the woman in the life of the the murderer, whereas this one is told from the perspective of the cop who is chasing the murderer. So that was a little less interesting to me. But then the second half becomes more about how do we unbrainwash the wife of the Nazi and get her to turn on her husband so that we can have her help in bringing him in. And that becomes more interesting because she is so invested in their relationship, even though it is clearly very toxic and unwilling to listen to reason. And so the the events that go down for her to finally be able to accept that the person she's put all of this trust in is not who she thinks it it, it is, is, um, yeah, much more interesting to me. But yeah, that's The Stranger, uh, Orson Welles. Um, I've heard of that one. It's been on my list for a while, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, I would definitely recommend it. I gave it three stars on Letterboxd, which is honestly probably a bit low. Um, like I said, it's mostly because that first half I've kind of felt like there's a better way to tell this story. But then in the second half, I think that choices, the storytelling choices kind of pay off a bit more. So I might raise that rating on thinking about it more. But I, it's very interesting. I would definitely recommend checking it out. I don't know if you look at letterbox the same way but sometimes i think about like the scale at which i rate movies and i'm like it doesn't actually make sense because in my mind for some reason if i watch a movie and i'm like yeah it was it was okay like it was an average 
it was an average movie. It was fine. To me, that's like three and a half stars, even though mathematically that should be two and a half, like, because it's out of five. <laughs> yeah. So two right and a half middle, should yeah. be like, yeah, it's, it's, a it's a fine movie. It's like, you know, it's fine. But in my mind, it's like, if I give anything two and a half stars, that means I hated it. <laughs> So like my letterbox is so leaned to the right of like everything is three and a half stars plus. I mean, obviously I have some things that are lower, but it's like, I feel like an average movie, I should rate it two and a half, but I always rate it three and a half. <laughs> do you, do you feel that way too? Or is that just me? No, I've, yeah, no, I'm, I'm right there with okay. you. Like I feel bad giving it three stars, even though that was the impression that I had at the end, yeah. but I'm like, there's so much, I mean, the actors in it are great and there's so much storytelling, like directorial skill behind it since it's directed by Orson Welles that I feel weird giving it such a low score. But it's not that low, like according to the- No, it's not. It's the thing. Like, three stars is above average if you're going out mm -hmm. of five. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We're. I guess we're just such type A, like- I guess, know, yeah. Got to get an A on every assignment. Yeah. Um, people. Uh, anyway, so next I saw Rosemary's Baby for the first time um, post Holly, uh, Halloween. <laughs> it was finally free at my library, and so I could rent it. Uh, great movie. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever watch it again because it's very disturbing, but it is a great oh, movie. Oh, you will watch it again. Um, man, I'm just like, I love John Cassavetes so much, even though I've only ever seen him in things where he plays like the absolute worst person in the world. And he's such a, in this movie, he is such a horrible, like gaslighting, abusive husband who like thinks that he's a nice guy, but he's totally not. And it's just like, oh, it's so creepy to watch, even though I love him as an actor. Um Mia Farrow is great. Uh, love Ruth, Ruth Gordon as her like nosy neighbor that you're just kind of annoyed by, but then it turns out that she's actually extremely sinister. Um, yeah, really, really well told movie. Obviously, there's a lot of sad irony there that like this movie that is so centered on a woman's um, trauma and loss of agency uh, would be directed by a notorious abuser, Roman Polanski. Um, but yeah, that's kind of one of those sad metatextual things but it is a very effective depiction of those things so yeah rosemary's baby that um is, I, I maybe you forgot about this i don't know but that is on my list of like one of my favorite movies of all time i oh, like oh interesting which is why i said I you will watch I knew, it again. i knew you really yeah <laughs> because... <laughs> i knew you really liked it but i didn't realize that it was like yeah like top oh it is top you. top it is one okay. of my favorite okay. films of all time i love that movie. all right well yeah I, mean, I hate that that movie is disgusting but but it's i love it so much well yeah i was gonna say like i feel like knowing what i know of you this would be a movie that would be extremely triggering for you so i'm surprised that it's one that you would be eager to rewatch. but yeah i'm i'll be very excited to hear your thoughts on it um i will i will try to put myself through it a second time <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, okay, so next I watched a rom-com called Rye Lane, which I know, Tatum, you've seen. Yeah, uh, also so a movie I, I, did I finally really liked. It. Yes, yes. It's so charming. It's on Hulu. It just came out. I think it's a 2023 film. It's very, very yeah, recent. Yeah, it's 2023. Okay. Yeah, it's it's just delightful. It's, it's really, really charming. It's, um, I mean, you know, it's a rom-com. It's got a very predictable plot. It Rem structurally it reminds me a lot of Man Up, which is another rom-com that I adore, <laughs> which is also set in London. Uh, but Rye Lane is um, very unique, at least compared to a, a more uh, mainstream like Hollywood rom-com in that it's a very, very diverse cast. It's set in a part of London that you don't often see in a mainstream ho uh, Hollywood rom-com. And the style of it is just so wonderful. It's so colorful and the filmmaking choices, the use of close-ups and sort of fantasy sequences. It feels very much like a musical, even though it's not. Um, both leads are extremely charming, and I really want them to have great careers and do a lot of other things because um, they're extremely talented. So yeah, Rye Lane, highly, highly recommend. Really made me miss London, <laughs> as does everything I watch that is set in London. Um, yeah. 
I'm so glad you liked it. I love that movie. It's very good. Um, and then finally, I saw 13 Lives, directed by Ron Howard, which just came out, uh, I think, last year, pretty recently, which is about the um, Thai soccer team that got stuck in the cave and the rescue efforts to save their lives. And I had heard kind of quietly really good things about this movie that like it didn't get a lot of fanfare but it's actually very well made and I actually agree I think this is a really fantastic movie Ron Howard is to me a director who is very uneven very uneven <laughs> very uneven he's made movies that I think are really really good and he's made a lot of movies that I think are very very mediocre um or even downright bad but this one I think is up toward the the upper end it reminded me a lot of Apollo 13 which I think is probably possibly his best movie or at least you know very close to the top it's very procedural it's very um it's not flashy but it's very focused on the human beings and helping you to understand the struggles that are happening and the efforts of all of these different people that led to this incredible rescue it's very well filmed and made in the sense of helping you to understand the dynamics of just geographically where everything is, you know, what does the cave look like? What does it look like for the diver to be um, reaching the the children? What are the struggles that they face? What are the dangers that they face? Um, you know, because there, there are a lot of physical dangers. There's a, uh, two divers actually died uh, as a result of the, the rescue efforts. And um, this movie does a great job of kind of going step by step. And the focus or, you know, the bulk of the screen, the majority of the screen time, I guess. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. It's a very ensemble film, which I think is to its strength. Definitely more of the focus is on the um, the volunteer divers who flew in from across the world who helped to to find the children and then were able to, to dive them out, um, which is to be understandable. But I really love how much of a focus there is on not just them, but all of the other volunteers, including... I mean, mainly from other parts of Thailand who helped out with the rescue and were, were orchestrating things and were bringing in their own areas of expertise. So you've got the governor of the, the state in which this happened, who is basically on his way out politically and is just kept in power in order to be a potential scapegoat if everything goes wrong. But he does so much to just be a sort of calm, wise presence in the midst of all of these things, making really hard decisions when he needs to. Um, it focuses on the parents who are, you know, terrified that their children are never going to be able to um, be rescued. It focuses on the, the team of uh, Thai Navy SEALs who put their lives at incredible risk in order to um, find and stay with the children and, and keep them um, healthy and, and safe throughout the, the entire rescue. Um, there's a, a Thai uh, water engineer who comes in and does incredible work in diverting the rains in order to keep the, the cave from um, flooding more than it already has. So yeah, there's just like so many different parts that go into it. And the movie does a really good job of balancing and explaining them all. And yeah, I really, really like this movie. I found it, it's long, but I found it so engrossing. So yeah, 13 Lives. I had never heard of it because Ron Howard is just such a I don't know he's not really a director that I specifically follow to see what he's making and see what's coming out and so I feel like every once in a while I'll just discover that oh Ron Howard made another movie <laughs> like there was a time I remember when I was younger I saw one of his movies which we'll talk about on this podcast at some point but it's called Cinderella Man and I really really loved it when I was little and so after I saw Cinderella Man, I was like, oh, man, this movie's so great. Who is this director? And so I started following everything he was making after that, and none of them were good. And so I was like, well, I'm not going to follow this director anymore. And then I just kind of have fallen off of that path. So, I mean, I know he makes good movies every once in a while, but um, he's just not someone that I really track what what he's making. So... Yeah, truly, the I think the reason that I knew about the existence of the movie and that people considered it to be good was because this was 22, which is the year where Colin Farrell had multiple great performances in Banshees of Inishira and After Yang. And then a lot of people would say, but he's also really good in 13 Lives. Uh, and you know what? Okay. He's really good in 13 Lives. He's really good in everything. 
He's good in everything. Yeah. yeah. He's a great actor. Um, Vigo Mortensen is also in it. Also great. Oh, love Vigo. Um, love Vigo. I'm and... a Vigo loyalist. <laughs> <laughs> as you should be he's a he's a great actor as well and yeah so <clears throat> the other thing i watched is damsels in distress which is also by Whit stillman just because i wanted to see an additional Whit stillman film before we talked about metropolitan but um i might bring that up later might not but it's kind of cute yeah okay but yeah i won't talk about it at length here yeah so yeah that's what i watched a lot of stuff cool yeah all right so let us talk a little bit about Metropolitan. Today on the show, we will be discussing Metropolitan, the 1990 directorial debut of filmmaker Whit Stillman. The film centers on Tom Townsend, a lower middle class college student from the west side of Manhattan, as he is swept up in the world of wealthy east side socialites. Tom is a serious and sometimes insensitive outsider who looks down on their privileged world, but he's also lonely, and so he agrees to be an escort for a series of debutante parties over the Christmas and New Year's holidays. Audrey, a sweet, bookish member of the socialite group, enjoys Tom's outsider's perspective and soon develops a crush on him, but he is still hung up on Serena, the beautiful, popular girl who recently dumped him. The group also includes Jane, Audrey's protective friend, Nick Smith, a cynical, snobby boy with a fanatical hatred of Serena's new boyfriend, Rick Von Sloniker, and Charlie, an awkward boy with a crush on Audrey who loves spouting completely ridiculous social theories. Most of the film is spent in the apartments of various members of the group as they gather to drink, gossip, and exchange grand ideas about how the world works. Tom, unaware of Audrey's crush on him, inadvertently hurts her feelings, but when he realizes that he and Serena don't see eye in eye, he starts to like Audrey back. The film ends with Tom and Charlie, worried that Audrey will allow herself to be seduced by Rick von Sloniker, taking a cab out of Manhattan to rescue her, only to find that Audrey was never in any danger. However, she is touched by Tom's concern for her, and the three of them end up trying to hitch a ride back to Manhattan together. So this film was truly an independent film. Um, Stillman was working as an illustrator at the time. He was in his 30s. He'd never directed a feature film before. And he sold his apartment and borrowed money in order to make this movie with a group of first-time actors. The film's budget was about $210,000. It ended up grossing $3 million in the U.S., so kind of a modest hit considering the budget. I feel like that's the a character huge hit. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Given that he sold his property to fund it, I like, know. That's a huge, that's a huge yeah, profit. I'll take that return. The character of Tom was loosely based on his own experience as a Harvard student staying with his divorced mother in Manhattan over the Christmas holidays. Stillman originally hoped to set the film in the 1960s, but the budget did not allow for that. So he did his best to give the film a nostalgic, removed from time feel through the set dressing and the use of the title cards. I found uh, music, myself. Things like that. I found mm -hmm. myself at one point in this movie, I mean, we'll get into it. This movie confused me in a lot of ways, but I found at one point myself thinking like, wait, when is this movie actually set? <laughs> because they yeah. seem to be dressed and, and speaking in certain ways, but then the couches and the, and the set decoration, I was like, wait, when is this actually taking place? <laughs> yeah. Well, especially cause like the, I mean, the whole idea of debutante balls and every everything they like they talk about it in the film they're like i didn't know this stuff still went on <laughs> and this is in 1990 like for us in 2023 it's like wait that that seems like another era you know another like century well i guess this is technically another century well i don't know anything about i really don't know anything about debutante balls debutante balls period so i don't even know do they still happen do, like truly the only thing that i know about debutante balls is the like tea and got like tv shows like gossip girl or the oc that had an episode where they're like let's have the characters go to a debut yeah ball. i just think of <laughs> just because we need drama i just think of she's the man when it's like mom oh my gosh yes that's right <laughs> <laughs> yeah so if any of our listeners have been part of a debutante ball uh please let us know because i would be fascinated to hear about that um yeah so um yeah. Oh, yeah. How did I get to this movie? So my my mom introduced me to this movie in, I think, I was probably like end of high school, early college sort of a thing. I don't know how she found it. I guess she just kind of stumbled across it and kind of vaguely liked it. And I also liked it. This movie is very... Um, 
well, it's, <laughs> as you'll know from watching the movie, it's very steeped in uh, um, and kind of in conversation with Jane Austen. Obviously, I was an English major and a huge Jane Austen nerd in college. I ended up writing my English major thesis on contemporary adaptations or reworking of Jane Austen novel plots. And this is one of the movies that I chose because this movie's plot, what little there is of it, is sort of vaguely in conversation with Mansfield Park, which is my favorite Jane Austen novel. Um yeah, I just I've returned to this movie over and over again over the years. It I wouldn't say it's a deeply personal film to me or kind of one of my top top favorites, but I really like it. I find it strangely soothing, probably because it's mostly set in apartments and everyone kind of talks in a flat mono monotone that is in no way related to reality, but is kind of um yeah, just sort of an interesting stylistic choice that I find very enchanting somehow. Um, and, you know, they're all deeply pretentious people who are kind of spouting these grand ideas about how the world works and arguing with each other. And it's just a great, I think, representation of that kind of you're in your early 20s. You think you've got everything figured out. You think you're the, that the group of friends that you're with are going to be your friends forever and you're all going to kind of change the world and take it by storm. And then slowly things fall apart. Your group disintegrates. The things that you thought you knew or the beliefs that you thought you held are kind of falling away and you start to emerge into the real world in a little bit you know, a little bit more, you start to realize that the actions that you take have consequences with, for the people around you and that maybe things are a little bit more complicated and less cut and dry than they seem. So yeah, I I don't know. I just really enjoy <laughs> this movie. I, I really enjoyed my recent rewatch. I think it's also very funny. I think Whit Stillman is a very funny filmmaker um, in a very, very dry way. Um, Damsels in Distress is also like this a little as well, though it's a little more consciously funny. And then um, the other film by him that I've seen is Love and Friendship from 2016, which is just straight up a laugh out loud, loud comedy um, and also an ad adaptation of a Jane Austen novella. So um, yeah, that's my history with this movie. Um, what were your thoughts on First Watch, Tatum? Well, I want to address initially the fact that you said that you find this movie to be soothing. I was watching this movie and I was like, I was like fidgeting because I was like, oh my gosh, when can I leave? Like if I was in this room with these people, I would be like, like anxious to get out of there <laughs> because I really just, it's these, these children, I just, I can't, I I can't with them. Um, and <laughs> I, I do understand what you're saying of it. It is kind of reminiscent of this idea of being at that age and you kind of feel like you know everything and, you know, you've got your life figured out and where you're going and what's going to happen. And um, and so I do I do see that in this movie for sure. But the particular social circle and social class in which that takes place is something that is so not my reality at all N not that it's yours either but like at least i'm assuming unless there's something about you that i don't know <laughs> secretly a debutante yeah. <laughs> no it's completely foreign to my experience <laughs> um but i'm just like i not only do i not really know anything about this world i also have zero desire to know anything about this world um I just, the world of the extremely wealthy and privileged, in a way, it's just not something that I want to enter into, and I don't really, not that their struggles aren't valid, I mean, people's struggles are valid no matter where they're from, um, but for me, I'm not interested in this demographic of society, um, so... I I will say also, though, watching this movie, I was already in a state where I was very tired. <laughs> um, so I think that that contributed to me uh, and how I watched this film. I did, like, fall asleep at one point. <laughs> um, and I also think... So I didn't know anything about this movie going in, and so I wasn't really prepared for what it was. It very much so feels like a play. 
of people just kind of sitting around and, and talking about things, which is fine. I've, I've enjoyed several movies that are like that, and I love theater, um, but I just wasn't prepared for it going in, and so I think it caught me off guard. I also, for a while, had no idea what was going on because the movie just kind of starts, and I was like, wait, what is happening? Like, where are these people coming from? Where, who are they? Do they know, like, what is happening? Like, I just felt like I was dropped in and I had no idea who any of these people were, like, where they were going. Because again, I don't know anything about debutantes. And, and I was like, wait, so is this a high school party? Or is this like a, an event that was planned? Are the, like, now they're getting together every night of the week? W what is going on? Like, I just, I was very confused. Um, and there's just a lot of characters and it was hard for me to keep track of I was, who's who. Think, <laughs> I was thinking as I was watching this, I will bet anything that Tata will come in and say, I have no idea who, what any of these characters' names are. And it's completely understandable because oh, yeah. I've now seen this movie like, you know, five or six times. I'm only just starting to get a handle on most of their names. I know the concept of who Serena is, but I don't know what she looks like. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think that... On the one hand, I really wanted to like this movie more because I it definitely gives like an indie cinema vibe. And I love watching indie movies and supporting indie movies of people who are either first time filmmakers or they're making things with a low budget and they're collaborating with first time actors and first time crews and things like that. Um, and I love movies like that. And so I wanted to like this more. I didn't. I think now that I've had some time to sit with it, because I watched this movie yesterday, I don't, I don't hate it. I think that potentially I could benefit from watching it again, but at the same time, I have zero desire to watch this movie ever again because, again, like this particular demographic of society does not interest me at all. And if anything, it makes me kind of angry <laughs> that this demographic of society exists because it... I'm like, there's so many people that anyway. Um, well, in that in that sense, you're probably kind of on the side of Tom Townsend as he uh, looks down on the uh, people around does him. Does he but also actually participates though? In their world. I don't think he actually <laughs> looks down on them. I think he, because he's fully participating and mm -hmm. yeah. Well, like, one taking of the things... advantage of and like enjoying yeah. the enjoying the perks of being in this group, you know. Because if he really looked down on it, he'd be like, well, I'm out of here. This is ridiculous. <laughs> but he, he, I have a sense that he wants to be like them. He wants to fit in. He wants to be in this group. And I'm like, why? No, go, go live a real life somewhere. <laughs> like, yeah. The sense that I get is that it's less about the sort of like glamorous trappings of the world. Although, you know, he clearly feels his poverty since it is is more recent as well his parents only split up three years ago um but i think it's really more for him this sense of belonging and sense of here are people who are willing to engage with me and accept me and invite me to things which is a very powerful and intoxicating force um but yeah the the trappings of glamour also probably you know are are things that he wouldn't say no to the thing about this movie and you know i it doesn't surprise me that you didn't like you didn't like it the thing that really appeals to me about this movie is like i said before its engagement with jane austen in a very um explicit way but also in an implicit way in the sense that this movie is kind of a it operates in a similar way to a jane austen movie this isn't a, the movie that jane austen would have read written if she was alive around this time but it has a very similar um, sensibility of this whole thing is a comedic social satire. So we're depicting these these privileged people and we're satirizing the way that they live their lives. But at the same time, it's also deeply concerned with the dynamics between its characters and the sort of morality of how you operate within social conventions. You know, conventions are in a sense made up but in a in another sense they're also the way by which we can um love the people in our lives or hurt the people in our lives and so being attentive to that is 
very important because that is how we maintain relationships. That's how we hurt people or help people. You know, so these are things that we need to be conscious of in the way that we live our lives. And so the film is choosing to do that through the the setting of, you know, these ridiculously wealthy and privileged kids who think they know everything and actually don't. Um, but I think the concerns that it has are very universal. Um, it could be exploring similar themes in different settings. It's just choosing to do so in the setting of this very exclusive, possibly fantastical, possibly non-existent um, 1990s New York socialite society. Yeah. And again, like I, mm, well, to a certain extent, I agree with what you're saying. It's just that this particular like demographic, demographic of people in which it's exploring those concepts is just not something that is really engaging to me. Um, but yeah, I, I find it I find it interesting that you I don't know. I'm I would like I would be interested to hear more of your thoughts on Tom specifically because I really felt like and again, maybe I'd benefit from watching it another time, which I probably won't, but um <clears throat> I I don't I kind of I don't know. I I felt like he was one of these people. Like I didn't I mean, obviously he has less money because he's taking public transportation and he's walking and he doesn't have a code and all of those things. Like, obviously he doesn't have necessarily the same financial means as them anymore, but he did. And I think he wants to be invited back in. And um, I don't know. I, I, I see him as being a lot more of a willing participant in this world. And I think that there's just a lot of but actually people in this movie that are like, but actually, particularly the the boys the the wealthy white boys who are like but actually this but actually that but I'm like I don't like but actually people and I feel like Tom is one of those people like you know it, it's an ongoing joke in the movie but the fact that he's like yeah actually I don't like Jane Austen because blah 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 and he's in basically like almost insulting this other person for their thoughts on Jane Austen and then we find out later on he's like yeah I actually haven't read it so. My favorite scene in the movie. I think about it all the time. I just feel like that communicates, at least to me, that he is the same breed as these people. And he, even though he theoretically maybe might not want to fit in here, which I think that he does, but th this, like, he is also these people. They are one and the same. Just because he doesn't have the same financial resources anymore doesn't mean that he's, like, not necessarily one of them. Yeah. My interpretation of Tom is that he is a young man who is really trying to establish his identity. And the way that he does that, that is by attaching himself to philosophical schools of thought or people or kind of grand statements about the universe. So when we first meet him, he's attached himself to Fourierism. <laughs> oh, you're a Fourierist, um, <laughs> which is this sort of like socialist, quasi-Marxist, you know, um, let's start a commune in the middle of nowhere and all live as equals, you know, very like idealistic pie in the sky, um, great intentions, not actually workable in the real world, but he doesn't really think that it's a problem that it's not workable in the real world. And because he's attached himself to it, you know, he's kind of like, well, I'll, I'll go to these things as sort of an observer, you know, but I can allow myself to remain detached from it. Um, but then as Nick is kind of taking him under his wing and, and um, expounding all of his thoughts and theories to him, Tom starts to attach himself to Nick instead. And as the film goes on, he becomes kind of more and more an apologist for Nick and like, oh, we shouldn't do this because Nick wouldn't like it. And, um, you know, he's, oh, is Nick going to come, come here and everything? Um, and then toward the end of the film, I think he's kind of coming to a more mature place of of understanding that there is a little bit more complexity to the world, uh, being able to separate himself a little more, possibly falling more under the influence of Audrey, but Audrey is a much more um, principled and kind person <laughs> than Nick is, so that's not necessarily 
a bad thing. Um, but I think there is that sense of like, he just wants to be a member of a group of some sort. And so when he has this opportunity to become part of this, the Sally Fowler Rat Pack, which he does not realize is just not really a thing that it exists. It kind of only exists temporarily over the holidays as all these college students are back in town and they're like, well, we have nothing else to do. So let's just hang out with each other and drink and party until we all go back to our respective colleges. And he thinks like, oh, this is great. This is like a, a new sort of permanent group that I can be a part of. But then it turns out it kind of falls apart as soon as it starts to exist. And he has to figure out some someplace else that he can go yeah i see that i just also think that he is one of them like i don't think he's like oh what can i do like <clears throat> how can i behave in order to belong here i think he's literally just being himself <laughs> and this is the type of person that he is um and there is you know it's not that simple. There is more complexity to that. But at the end of the day, I don't see him as much of an outsider as I think. Yeah. I mean, he talks about like he used to have a trust fund exactly. back when his yeah. parents were together. And then that's gone away. And he, um, you know, he says it doesn't really bother him. I don't get a huge sense that he's lying about that. But it definitely does mean that he is sort of myopic and unself-aware about certain aspects of himself and his upbringing. And kind of within the last few years, he's been forced to have a different perspective on it. So he does have more experience of the world than the others do, but he is still very blinded to his own privilege in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I mean, this is, I, I'm not sure the way in which you want to talk about this movie, but one of my, and maybe... <laughs> honestly <laughs> well there's so little plot that i figured we could just kind of talk about the movie as a whole and kind of jump from character or plot point to character or plot point as the fancy strikes us okay cool not necessarily go chronologically because i was going to bring something up at the end i don't know if i was just more <laughs> i don't know if i was more engaged towards the ending because i perked up because i knew it was going to be over soon or <laughs> or if it or if I genuinely got more interested towards the end, I do think I got more interested towards the end because it was less focused on all of these wealthy self -pro proclaimed bourgeoisie people sitting in their the urban wealthy hot bourgeoisie rooms talking about a bunch <laughs> of nonsense that I was like, oh gosh. But towards the end, we really left those spaces, and that was when it got interesting. It's like, oh, what's happening to this friend group, and they're breaking up, and no, and now we're actually seeing their true colors of recognizing that they don't actually like hanging out and they're recognizing the facade in like, you know, if there's not alcohol, then why, what am I doing here? Like, I'm actually not that funny. And you know, all of these different ideas. Um, yeah. Where Fred is like, if I don't have anything to drink, like I don't actually have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I perked up towards the end because I feel like for me, that's when it actually got interesting because I wasn't, having to just sit in a room with privileged people talk about their privileged problems and um and so I really liked that I, I couldn't fully understand it because again I was still kind of tired but um I liked that moment when they interacted with that older man in the bar and they were like yeah so this is what your life is like right and he was like I mean kind of but also <laughs> yeah. not really you know and I love this moment when I should have written it down. I forget what the term was that uh, I think his name's Charlie kept using that had bourgeoisie in it. It was like, yeah, urban oat bourgeoisie or ub. He kept <laughs> talking about it and he was like obsessed like, with it. Like stop trying to make fetch happen. I know. He was so obsessed with it. And then he brought it up to this guy and he was like, yeah, so you're a part of this, right? And the guy was like, what is that? He's like, oh, you know, so it's this concept, blah, 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 blah. And then the man responded something along the lines of, yeah, I don't know about all that, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charlie is like his whole, who in my notes, I, I forgot until like halfway through the film that his name was Charlie. And so I kept calling him Christian Bale guy because <laughs> I thought he looked like Christian Bale. I literally Googled, is that Christian Bale? <laughs> I'm not even kidding you. Because I'm glad we're on I the same knew page. I, the first role I'd ever seen Christian Bale in was the 1994, I think it's 94, Little Women. And so I was like, well, he doesn't look the same as he did in that movie. 
But this is four years earlier, so it could yeah. still be I mean, him. <laughs> Newsies was 92. Like, he was around. He was doing stuff. Yeah, so I was like, is it Christian Bale? And then I looked it up, and I was like, no, it's not. But that's so funny that we both <laughs> the <Yeah>. same thing. <laughs> um, where was I going? Oh, yeah, just Charlie. His, like, his little social theories and the things that he says that are so self-serious throughout the film. Like, his... I'm, the way he is so utterly convinced that the urban haute bourgeoisie are doomed to failure. And like, that's a huge part of the thesis that he's presenting to this older man at the bar. He's like, don't you agree that we're all doomed to failure? And he's like, no, we're more just doomed to a life of like mediocrity, (laughs) you know, like, and then Tom is like, you know, he seemed a lot more optimistic than you are, Charlie. And Charlie's like, yeah, I don't think that's realistic. (laughs) Yeah. But then at the same time, he's so defensive of the idea of the bourgeoisie. He's like, the bourgeoisie are like <clears throat> the people who've like created everything that's that's good about modern society, you know, the and culture keeps making fun of the bourgeoisie, but you know, they really should see the positive aspects on it. And it's just like, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> you know? I love it so much. Um yeah, like he's just he's so convinced of his ideas and it's this sort of like combination of self-deprecation you know of of him and his friends and like their entire social class but also defensiveness about it and yeah just having not really any understanding of the larger world or even just all of these things that seem so important to you now when you're in college and you have nothing better to do but sit around and think about <laughs> who you are and who your entire life is and, you know, your your social class and everything, they're not going to seem as important when you're out and you're working in a job and you're, like, disappointed by the way that your life has turned out. But it's also you have a good job and so it's not really that bad of a life. Like, all of these per- things that you keep obsessing over are going to seem a lot smaller when you get older. And see more of the world. I don't know. I'm still obsessing over them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. I'm not like content with my life and just going through the motions. Sometimes I wish I could be that way, but <clears throat> sometimes, huh? A lot of the time, I wish I could be that way. <laughs> what did you think of Nick, who was the um, the the like more confident, very cynical guy who keeps t- like talking about how awful? rick van sloniker is and do you know who i'm talking Mm -hmm. about yeah i mean aside from the fact that i hated him i mean (laughs) um i don't i don't really have i mean maybe if you talk about it more more thoughts will come up for me but i just i just i hated him you're talking about nick right not rick yes okay yeah nick yeah yes. nick sucks <laughs> yeah um the only thing i kept thinking is that this guy is in new girl and he's playing the same role in new girl <laughs> or not new girl sorry gilmore <laughs> girls um yeah gilmore girls like he's yeah. literally playing the same role in gilmore girls and that i was thinking about oh this movie is basically capturing all of the things that i hated most about gilmore girls <laughs> gilmore <laughs> girls true i like that show until it goes really heavily into this aspect of their lives and i'm like no i hate this now <laughs> Um, yeah, Nick is the worst, but he's also so, I love Chris Agamon. I've got to say, I think he gives the best performance in this movie. I think he's so charismatic and fun to watch. And if this movie has a flaw to me, it's definitely that once he leaves, it becomes a little bit less interesting. See, Um, once he left, I was like, yes, now I'm interested. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I just think he's a very charismatic actor um i enjoyed him a lot in gilmore girls so that was mainly residual love because of metropolitan (laughs) yeah i mean again i feel like when watching this movie and i I mean this i don't want to like alienate potential listeners but like you know while i was watching this movie i just really because of the vibe that this movie has it feels like it's kind of inviting you into the space it feels like you are kind of a fly on the wall sitting in this room with these people and so I just kept I really felt like I was there which maybe is a strength of the movie it's like a good thing that a movie is able to transport you to that place and that's a strength but you know I was just picturing myself sitting in this room and I was like if I was in a room and this person was here this is the worst person in the room and I would I just I don't like people that have that sort of attitude because 
the charisma of these particular people in this sort of way, I hate so much because you pull people into your nonsense and it's, you feel so self-important and it's like, you like the attention and I'm not going to give you the attention because I know that it's what you want. And so I don't know. I think he, he just is a terrible person. I really don't like him. And if I met him in real life, I would leave because when I meet people like this, I hate being around them so much that I leave. <laughs> well, it's that's sort of the exact arc that not not the not the full arc, but like I love the fact that Tom's whole arc in this movie is kind of, you know, getting seduced in a way by this group of friends and mostly by the the sort of charisma and willingness to take him in of Nick and then kind of becoming like a sort of proto disciple of Nick and then realizing as the group starts to break up oh actually everyone in the group hates Nick <laughs> and they just sort of barely tolerate him because he's a member of their social set but actually he really drives them nuts and that sort of like naivete to disillusionment is a huge part of of Tom's character arc. And I don't know, I also find it fascinating though that I don't know the the vehemence with which Nick keeps railing against Rick Van, Von Sloniker. Every time I'm watching I watch this movie, I'm like I'm trying to unravel a little more why he hates him so much. I mean, I think it's it's obviously insecurity. It's obviously a sort of like he has that speech where he's like oh you keep saying that rick is shy but if an actual shy guy tried to talk to you you know you would your eyes would glaze over like it's a very like nice guy quote unquote speech that sort of like oh i'm a nice guy so you should like me you know that sort of thing like this very toxic male mentality at the same time it doesn't seem like he's wrong about rick <laughs> like rick really does seem like a, a player he's he's a huge jerk um, but yeah, the, the sort of standing of Nick, I think is, is really interesting. And his, like, he has the sort of principled stand against him, but it is, you know, it's not wrong, but it's definitely made up of a lot of subsumed insecurity. Possibly there could be some repressed, like, attraction to Rick. I don't know if I'm reading too far into it, but I feel like there could be some of that too. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just find Nick very an intriguing character. I love that for you. I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, Rick Von Sloniker. I actually, uh -huh. my favorite character in this movie, assuming I can have one, is Charlie. I, mm. I just think that he, you know, I don't know what this says about me, but whenever I'm in social spaces and i mean this in a totally endearing way i love weird people because i am a very weird of a person <laughs> and so if i'm ever in a space and i'm like oh that person's kind of weird and maybe doesn't fully fit in here but clearly they're trying or whatever i'm just kind of like i want to be friends with you and just see who you are like be, be yourself because you seem awesome. I want to be in your space. And I felt like Charlie kind of gave me those vibes of he's a guy who he's here because by coincidence, he happens to have money, like as much money as these people and as much privilege as these people. But at the same time, he's very socially awkward. And so in that way, he's kind of overcompensating. It's almost like Mr. Collins where he has a prepared speech of like, these are the topics that I'm going to discuss. And I feel like these topics will be relevant to this audience of people. And so I'm going to try it out. And it just very much so feels that way to me. Um, but I also think that at the end, he shows himself as a true friend to Tom. It seems like, you know, in the midst of this group of teenagers or early 20-somethings who are all putting on an act to, to maybe have some sort of facade that they get along it seems like they found each other in the midst of this and they're like, Hey, I think we do actually vibe, you know? And, um, I think, I don't know. I feel like Charlie, when he talks about these concepts of like the bourgeoisie or whatever, it just seems like he's just saying something because he doesn't know what to say. <laughs> it doesn't seem like he actually believes it in a, mm -hmm. 
Well, I think it's all an intellectual game to him Mm -hmm. in a sense. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but just in a sense of like, he just is someone who loves to debate abstract intellectual ideas. They don't really have a lot of practical implications for him. He just likes to kind of bandy ideas back and forth. And most of the rest of the group is kind of like, all right, yeah, whatever, like, go ahead and speak your pace. We don't really care. It doesn't. It doesn't seem to me it like I've met people in my life who they just play devil's advocate all the time and they're always wanting to argue and have a debate and that just kind of bothers me. I'm like it doesn't know everything doesn't always have to be a debate, right? But I don't see Charlie as that as that type of person. I genuinely yeah. see him He's not like confrontational or argumentative. No, he literally just seems like someone who in my mind doesn't know how to communicate well and so he's just kind of running through a list of topics trying to see what sticks and because nothing ever sticks because no one cares about what he's talking about (laughs) he just thinks okay I'll try another one that didn't work either I'll try another one so it doesn't seem like he's constantly trying to spark debate it seems like he's constantly trying to figure out how can he say something that interests (laughs) these people in order to have a conversation with them Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> well, and he's also, I mean, you know, he's the most, obviously, he's always like spouting these sort of ideas about their class and, and um, you know, the fact that they're all doomed or what the bourgeoisie represents and things like that. But he is also in a certain way similar to Audrey in that he's also the mo- most kind of personally principled person and the most sensitive to... um sort of interpersonal and social dynamics in a certain way well at at least specific to audrey not necessarily specific to other people but because he has this crush on audrey he's very you know when tom slights her he takes that very very personally and i i really love the sort of um transition like you say of tom and charlie's friendship because at the start of it charlie is very he's very jealous of Tom and he also sees these flaws in Tom and the ways that Tom is kind of thoughtlessly rude to Audrey and that Charlie takes that very personally and he he has that line about like when you're an egotist none of the harm that you do is intentional Mm -hmm. um which you know I I think Tom like he he doesn't really he takes that to heart he doesn't really like it you know it take that on right away, but I think that is something that is um, he does take eventually take seriously. And so the fact that they are able to transition from Charlie really being suspicious to Tom and seeing his flaws to realizing that actually there is more to Tom, like he he has growing to do, but there is still potential for him to be a more thoughtful person, and that he does have this depth to him that a lot of the other members of the group don't have. Um, is really sweet and you know as nick goes away charlie comes more to the forefront as an influence in tom's life and so he ends the the film in a place where he has these two friends now in charlie and audrey who are more thoughtful more considerate more principled people than who he ended up who he was with for most of the film one of my favorite moments in the movie which was the most relatable for me was um because there's so much in this movie that I'm like, I don't relate to this. Um, but it's this moment when um, Charlie and Tom, I don't remember the context of everything, but somehow they, I think they end up, they end up somewhere. I don't, this movie, I was confused. They end up somewhere <laughs> at at the end of the night. And Tom basically says to Charlie in a very kind of desperate sort of way, you know, he says, call me tomorrow. <laughs> And Nick is, or Charlie responds, you know, I'll call you. And Tom's like, no, seriously, please call me tomorrow. And Charlie's like, I'll call you at seven. Yeah. That's when they're trying to figure out whether Audrey's in trouble or not. Right. But I just thought it was this really cute friendship moment of like, hey, um, I really need a friend. Will you please call me tomorrow? And Charlie is like, I'll call you. And then Tom's like, no, seriously. And then Charlie's like, no, seriously, like. I mean it. I I also need a friend. Like I will call you tomorrow at seven. It was this really sweet. I liked that because mm-hmm. I I feel like in that scenario I'm kind of Tom. I in my mind I don't tell my friends necessarily like call me tomorrow, but but I definitely have that feeling all the time. <laughs> so I thought that that was that was sweet. 
Yeah, I love that. And then their whole the whole montage of the two, it's like comedy montage of the two of them walking into various car rental places trying to rent a car. And in each place it goes wrong. It's like one, Charlie can't use his mom's credit card. Two, they, you know, um, the lady is, I guess, rude to them somehow. They were probably asking her some ridiculous question. And then three, it turns out that neither of them have driver's licenses, so they can't rent a car to begin with. Oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh, there's just so like his Charlie's whole th- idea about like oh the urban alt bourgeoisie, you know, they're so they're doomed to failure because they're all so like in ill equipped to deal with the realities of the world. And here it's like all of those things are playing out. Like these two people are completely ill <laughs> unequipped to deal with anything that involves getting out of Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um I have a question for you mm-hmm. as someone who engages with the concept of romance in a very different way than I do. Um, What are your thoughts on Tom and Audrey? I think they're very cute together. Although on this viewing, I was like, actually maybe Audrey should be with Charlie. (laughs) Cause he clearly like really sees something in her and they, they do have a similarity in a sort, but I, I do really like Tom and Audrey together. I don't know if they're intended for the long term. But I think them both having this sort of outsider status within this group and the fact that even when they, like, they are such different people and they disagree very strongly on things, but in a way that's pretty respectful and allows both of them to grow and consider other options. Like Tom, you know, he comes to his conversations about Jane Austen to Audrey with this very pronounced, like, this is the way it is. Oh, well, obviously everyone feels this way, which again is my favorite conversation in the film. And when I see this film referenced elsewhere, it's usually this particular scene, the one where he talks about how, oh, I never read novels. I just read good literary criticism because that way you get the novel and the critic's point of view, which is so ridiculous. That and Audrey herself no is like, sense. what are you it talking make about? Any sense. But it's so representative. And I think it's such a smart writing choice. It's so representative of Tom's kind of very, you know, sheltered at this point view of the world of just there's a shortcut to understanding everything and it's just to skip straight to the literary criticism. I get the bullet point ideas and then I can use those ideas in conversation to start smart, to to sound smart. Whereas when you read a novel, I mean, that takes more time because the novel is longer. It's more complex because novels don't necessarily have a cut and dried moral. You might find yourself empathizing with characters that you wouldn't have expected or um, char- things that characters you you like might do something that's troubling to- toward you. It requires real intensive engagement, which is something that Tom is not prepared to do at this point in his life. And so part of this film is him learning to appreciate novels and learning to appreciate, you know, maybe life is more complex and I have to do more work and I have to be more self-aware and self-critical. And I think that's just a very important to the the theme of the film overall. Yeah, I I was watching this and I desperately wanted Audrey and Tom not to get together. (laughs) I, I just felt like one of the themes in this whole movie is that Audrey keeps making excuses for Tom. And they're like, Audrey, Tom is, you know, he's treated you this way and he's ignored you. And very clearly, he kind of is more into Serena and da 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 But she's just like, no, but he this and he that. And I'm like, girl, no, <laughs> like, he's not, he's not into you. And if he is, he's not into you enough that you deserve, like, you deserve better than someone who kind of almost sees you as an afterthought like he has this this realization later on in the movie where he's like oh wait maybe actually she's the one who's really really actually loved me all along and it's like okay well I don't I don't know I just feel like I feel like she deserves better and I feel like Charlie actually really sees her for who she is and appreciates her whereas Tom is like I just want to fight you because I like to fight people and just debate them and make them feel like they're wrong and I'm right. And, um, I, I don't know. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't work for me. It gives me toxic yeah. vibes. It gives me vibes that this guy is toxic. He's not ready to date. And you are a sweet, kind woman who, who has hopefully, 
I would like to think, you know, you see enough of your value and self-worth that you'll be with somebody who actually also sees that. But um, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like a good pairing to me. Um, But yeah, anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm also coming at it from the perspective of um so this is the the part of the the film that most closely echoes you know it's not a direct copy or a direct adaptation but it echoes uh dynamics within Mansfield Park which is most of Mansfield Park Fanny Price is in love with Edward Edmund Bertram who is um you know he's very kind to her and they really connect and they have this they share similar values in life similar principles they're both kind of outsiders within this very um you know elitist snobby <laughs> uh, social setting of Mansfield Park but at the same time throughout most of Mansfield Park Edmund is in love with this other woman who is um she's you know she's beautiful she's uh witty she's sparkly and flashing in a way that Fanny Price is not and so a huge part of that book is Edmund coming to recognize that these things that you know he he needs to mature in his understanding of where true value lies and the things that attract him to Mary Crawford are things that are temporary and are things that are not actually conducive to a long-term relationship whereas the things that attract him to or you know you know he he for most of the the book is not attracted to Fanny Price like he he loves her but he just sees her as a friend he doesn't see her in a romantic way but the end of the book is him coming to recognize oh actually I maybe I can have romantic feelings toward this person that I really really value and we can have this really beautiful relationship together because we do have even though we are very different one of the things that Edmund brings to Fanny is that he is he's a member of this world which she is not and he can encourage her to put herself forward or can be kind of her her defender her like um liaison with the outside world in the way that others are not willing to you know he has this kindness with him to do this and so it's them being very two very different people but having this sort of shared core of values that allow them to enter into a relationship with each other at the end. So I'm kind of coming to it from that perspective of even though Tom and Audrey are very different and Tom clearly has a lot of growing up that he needs to do, there is something in him that would, I think, make him a good partner for Audrey and vice versa. Again, I don't know if it's intended for the long term, but at least, um, you know, it is a step in his development that he starts to recognize her worth. Yeah, I just engage with romance differently, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> and also for the listener, I I think maybe we've discussed this on the podcast before, maybe not, um, but I have not read any Jane Austen, really. I, um, I read part of Pride and Prejudice when I was younger and didn't finish it. Um, and a lot of, because I don't really have a connection to the books, most of the adaptations, like the book to screen adaptations, I haven't seen. So, um, yeah, I just, I'm just putting that out there. My, yeah, my mm -hmm. relationship to Jane Austen is practically nothing compared to Geneva. So, um, yeah. Actually, there was one other, I apologize, but one other like relationship to Jane Austen that I wanted to bring up about this movie. Um, but w is just in the way that it uses kind of specific choices that people make as sort of a metaphor um or an extrapolation point for larger truths about the way that human beings interact with each other um and what i mean by that is for example the idea of letters in this film and what a letter represents to another person to someone like serena a letter is something that's very disposable you know you you write a bunch of letters to people to kind of um we get this sort of temporary effect of having a lot of boyfriends and then you throw them away um, while you have them. You read them aloud to people. You know, they're not special to her in a way, but they are really special to Tom. And he is very hurt when he discovers that Serena has been reading his letters aloud to other people. But he wrote some of the good ones. He he, he wrote some yeah. of the good ones. Yeah. <laughs> he is assured by that. But or, or when he learns that Serena has just given away his letters and destroyed the letters that he doesn't keep, that she hasn't kept. Like, it's 
partly his own, you know, oh, I put a lot of work into this and you just kind of given it away like it's nothing. But it's also, I think, for him, the larger principle of how do you treat the um, the effort that people put into your life? Or how do you look back on relationships even after they've ended? Do you continue to keep um, aspects of it or do you just kind of dispose of everything and move on? And he and Serena have very different views on this. And the fact that Audrey is someone who agrees with him that letters are special and are something that it's meant to be kept, I think is a an indication to us too of their sort of value, the the compatibility of their values. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, I mean, so much of this movie too is just about the idea of social conventions and how social conventions are made up, but they can also be, you know, violating social conventions can also lead to real hurt but then there's also that whole conversation about like when they play that game and audrey's like i think this is a bad idea for us to play it because there's a social convention against being totally honest and it exists for a reason and everyone's like don't be ridiculous but then it you know they play that game and the the truth comes out and it's very hurtful but it's also ultimately helpful in a certain way and so there is that kind of complexity of like honesty can be dangerous It can also lead to truth, you know, which you can deal with well, but it can also lead to hurt at the same time. I don't know. Do you have any feelings about that whole incident, about the the cigarette and tissue game or just the way that the characters sort of, you know, they live in such a socially regimented world and like violations of those social conventions like Tom not taking like going leaving to take Serena home when he should have stayed around for Audrey and everyone's like scandalized by this but I mean it's understandable because it is pretty rude yeah I don't know do you have any thoughts on that uh I think I was pretty zoned out during most of the like I said a lot of the just them sitting in rooms the center central like the the middle part of the movie yeah i just was very disconnected <laughs> so okay. like i remember <laughs> the game happening and i remember the truth that it led to and like how it affected things but in terms of deeper thoughts regarding just like the social rules and the social norms within this group i don't really i i checked out because like i said this this section of society i don't really I don't really in- care to engage with it, so I wasn't really paying attention. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, I mean, but see. you're welcome to, just... to share your thoughts. I feel like you haven't shared your thoughts. Oh, well, I kind of just did okay. <laughs> share my thoughts. So that I just think it's... I really like the the way that this movie interacts with those sorts of things, kind of showing, which I think, again, is kind of characteristic of Jane Austen, showing the the limitations that social conventions place on us but also their usefulness and so interacting in a society as we're all in a society um with you know some sense of morality requires being conscious of those things you know to not violating social conventions without an understanding of the consequences that that will have Mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah that makes sense yeah um all right i'm looking through my notes to see if there's anything else that i really wanted to talk about um let's see we haven't really talked about rick von sloniker a whole lot apart from the fact that he's just kind of seems to be a elitist jerk (laughs) as so many of them are um oh tom and his father is kind of a running subplot as well we never see tom's father tom starts the movie thinking saying like oh i actually have a great relationship with my father even though we're divorced my parents are divorced like i have lunch with him every time i'm in town but then slowly he starts to realize like actually his father is not as invested in this relationship as he is and eventually he discovers his father donated all his childhood toys and then moved out of state to santa fe without even telling him which is a horrible thing to do um Yeah, do you have any thoughts on that whole, like, subplot of of Tom kind of coming to realize that his father is kind of a huge jerk? Yeah, I didn't pick up on any of that. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) Like, I I literally, I was so checked out for so much of Mm -hmm. this movie. Like, I, I did not, I was not even aware that any of that happened. All I knew was that 
his parents were divorced and they used to have money and now they don't anymore. That was like the extent of what I knew about his father. So everything you just said is a complete shock to Completely me. Completely like, new I did information. Not, I was not even aware that any of that happened. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's just a rubbing. Like, again, we never actually see his father. He never interacts with him. It's all just in dialogue, him talking about like, oh, I tried to call my dad's office and, you know, he didn't pick up. I've been trying for weeks to call him and he's not been answering. I guess I don't have the good relationship with him that I thought I did. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. Um, there is um, the... Because there's a point at which Tom and uh, Nick are walking home and they walk past the building where his dad lives or used to live. He doesn't realize now. And they see these boxes of toys out on the street. And Nick is like, like philosophizing about like, oh, the, you know, the detritus of our youth or anything. But Tom has this, gets this very strange look on his face. And what we, it's implied is that these are Tom's toys that have just been left out on the street by his dad as his dad was moving out and so what a Tom crazy ta- coincidence <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so tom takes this little like toy gun that he had had when he was a kid and then that's what he uses at the end to threaten <laughs> oh <laughs> threaten von um von sloniker okay um anyway yeah so that's just all just a little running thing i did really love at the end uh when they're they like barge into von sloniker's house and they're like Audrey, are you okay? And she's like, "Yeah, I'm fine." Like you were, like, what's going on? Um, and then Tom, like, Von Sloniker punches them to try and get them to leave, and Tom pulls out his gun, which is just, you know, it's like a toy gun. But, but Charlie goes, "Careful, he's a Fourierist," which I thought was really funny. Oh, wait, what does that even mean? That's his uh, the Marxist philosophy that he subscribes to. Oh, Fourier. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so it's like it doesn't make any sense. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Any any other notes that you have or any parts of the film that you feel like we haven't talked about? Not on my end, I don't think. Yeah, there's so many good, like, little bits of very dry comedic dialogue in this. Like the part where the group is playing strip poker and one of the girls, um, I think it might be Sally, is just like, oh, I fold. And they're like, but like you don't have to fold and she's like no i just want to <laughs> and nick goes playing strict poker with an exhibitionist somehow takes the challenge away <laughs> yep um <clears throat> let's see anything else yeah i think we've talked about pretty much all of it um I really love the ending. I mean, we've talked about it a little bit already, but just that that shot of the three of Tom and Charlie and Audrey, Audrey having been rescued from Von Sloniker's, but she's very much like, yeah, I just went here to get away from everyone else. Like, I'm I'm totally fine. <laughs> like, But she's still like, you know, she's clearly very happy that they were thinking of her enough to come and make sure that she was okay. So yeah, the three of them just like trying to get home, these three like privileged kids in their overcoats walking through the middle of a suburban street, trying and failing to hail a taxi. It's just, I feel like it's such a great final place to leave these characters on where it's like they're now together, you know, these three people who really have a chance at a long lasting friendship. They are also pretty helpless and out of their element and (laughs) it's going to be a challenge for them to figure out how to get home. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Let us move on then. Uh, Shorter than usual episode, but that's all good. I'm really happy about this conversation. Um, So awards and legacy. So this movie was nominated for best original screenplay at the Oscars. Uh, It also got a variety of other awards and nominations. Uh, it was nominated for Best Screenplay and Best Female Lead at the Independent Scre- uh, Spirit Awards, and it actually won Best First Feature, the Independent Spirits. The New York's films, uh, New York Film Critics Circle gave it Best New Director and Runner-Up for Best Screenplay. It was also nominated for the Grand Jury Prize in the Dramatic Category at the Sundance Film Festival. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not bad for a little little independent film. Yeah, not um, bad. <laughs> not bad. Congrats, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so critical response. As of now, Metacritic has it at 77, <laughs> based on like four reviews. <laughs> really not a very um widespread. Rotten Tomatoes has it at 93%. Um, I pulled let's see, do I want to read both of these? Yeah, why not? 
<clears throat> I pulled two reviews. First, our good friend Roger Ebert gave this film three and a half stars. He wrote... Whit Stillman has made a film Scott Fitzgerald might have been comfortable with, a film about people covering their own insecurities with a facade of social ease. And he has written wonderful dialogue, words in which the characters discuss ideas and feelings instead of simply marching through plot points, as most Hollywood characters do. Not very much happens in Metropolitan, and yet everything that happens is felt deeply, because the characters in this movie are still too young to have perfected their defenses against life. They care very deeply what others think of them. Their feelings are easily hurt. Their love affairs are really forms of asking for acceptance. And then the second quote I pulled was by a writer named Jamie Chrisley, writing for Slant Magazine in 2015. Making metaphorical mincemeat out of his preppy subjects is about the last thing on Stillman's agenda. And, on the evidence of four films, he's quite aware that his creations are more than a little fanciful. Confection is one of the more frequently used terms in reviews. Beneath the licorice sweet tart flavor, however, are hints of rueful loneliness and dissatisfaction, which come a cropper later in the film as the characters are slow to realize that their hot little cabal wasn't much of a thing to begin with, it certainly wasn't held together by universal affection, and it's now gone. The final third of Metropolitan shows its survivors, or they're the walking dead, somehow scatter somewhat scattered like shrapnel, seeking closure the only way they know how, rather ineffectually, but with the absolute conviction of those that love. Can I just say, <clears throat> mm -hmm. this is something that I actually wanted to mention a little bit earlier on. Um, I've recommended this movie to you before, but I think after watching this, after watching this particular movie, I'm going to recommend it to you again. This movie reminds me a lot of, but I mean, it's, it's very different, but in terms of people kind of sitting around and talking about you know, kind of existential sorts of topics and how that relates to their reality and how they're developing in their life right now and all of that stuff. It reminds me of the movie La Dolce Vita. Um, the, oh, have you recommended? You probably have recommended that to yeah. me. Yeah. I think it's been a while since. Okay. Yeah. It, um, there's like, there's just several movies from, you know, Italy around, you know, this, this time when people just kind of Nothing really happens in the movie other than people walking around it. I mean, that's not true. Things happen in La Dolce Vita. But for the most part, it's like a man and his wife kind of figuring out their relationship and walking around and having all of these different discussions with people and different aspects of their lives at, at social parties or at a hospital or whatever. And um, yeah, I don't know. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, La Dolce Vita, both for you and also a listener, if you haven't seen that movie, it's very, very good. It's very long. It's like three times as long as this movie. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of something where you have to, you know, really sit back and be in a mood or maybe even watch it in multiple sittings. But it's a very, it's a similar vibe, but I would argue maybe better. But um, yeah, it's, yeah. Anyway, this movie made me think yeah. of that okay. one. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. That movie has been on my list for a while, you know, as like, famous french films that no it's not french italian 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 um yeah famous italian 60s films that i need to watch but i didn't realize it had a similar vibe that makes me extra excited to watch it, it. like i said it's still very different but mm -hmm. it has a similar vibe yeah i mean i i, I do love a, a good movie that's about just people sitting around and talking mm -hmm. to each other well i have other ones i could recommend to you if that's a vibe that you like <laughs> okay <laughs> you should put together a letterbox Ooh, list that'd be fun yeah. All right. So final thoughts. Um, yeah. I Again, a lot of the reasons that I love this movie and why it really uh, speaks to me is just because of its sort of shared, like, thematic and stylistic um, influences with Jane Austen, um, who I'm, yeah, like I said, I'm just a big English literature nerd. So, um but yeah, and I, I, I find it soothing. <laughs> I just enjoy kind of sitting in rooms listening to pretentious people talk about ideas because that's something I do enjoy doing in my personal life as well. Wait, is it really? <laughs> oh, I love sitting around and talk, having a super deep conversation with someone about like grand ideas about the world. Particularly the pretentious people aspect of it. Do you like sitting around pretentious people? And having these discussions? I feel like I can be pretentious, so I'm not going to, like, exclude myself from that. Okay, interesting. Does this mean <laughs> yeah, I'm a pretentious person? No, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know. I don't necessarily... I think I, I don't necessarily view 
pretentious is like a horrible thing in the same way you do. I mean, it's not a good thing, but I also just, I have a lot of affection for pretentious conversation. Interesting. <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, to me, the beauty of co the college experience is just sitting around at rooms at 3 a.m. and having super deep conversations with people that once you graduate, you're never going to see again. But in that moment, you're like, this is the deepest conversation I've ever had in my life. And this is the person that I feel most close to in the entire world. Like, I don't know. I think there's something really beautiful about that, how temporary it is and how sort of ultimately not, you know, having any impact in the world around you. But I don't know. I just I love a sort of deep, intense intellectual engagement in that sort of way, just as like a an exercise or a sort of temporarily stepping out and thinking really deeply about something. And so, you know, even though these characters are like extremely privileged and blind in many ways, and so a lot of the things that they're philosophizing about are just completely ridiculous, um, I enjoy the actual activity of that. And so watching them, yeah, I find it a lot of fun to just kind of hang out and listen to them say they're <laughs> ridiculous, you know, immature. Okay. Well, just to um, throw another one out there because I, I forgot about it. Um, so I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to correct something that I said before and also mm -hmm. add another movie to the recommendation that I told you. So La Dolce Vita is a movie of this similar vibe that I would highly recommend. But the description that I gave is inaccurate because... <laughs> I get very confused sometimes because Marcello Ma Mas I never know how to say his name Marcello Mastroianni or whatever um a lot of movies that he's in I kind of get them confused and he's in both of these movies so the description that I gave for Dolce Vita is actually the um the plot summary ish for the movie La Not which is a French film oh. so mm -hmm. both of those movies have a similar vibe to this one and they're both starring Marcello but one is Italian <laughs> and one is French and okay Yes, La Not is, is shorter than La Dolce Vita, but they're both very good. So just throwing both of those out there. Okay, thank you. I will, I don't, La Not had not been on my radar, so I will Ooh, add that on as well. Yeah, check that one out. They're, they're both, like I said, they kind of came out around the same time period. The 1960s mm -hmm. really, was, at yeah, least that in French international Italian new wave. Cinema, was, cinema was very much so a lot of people walking around and, you know, talking about life. Seventh Seal is kind of like that, you know, mm. that. A lot I mean, of breathless is very much like that. Yeah. So anyway, there's yeah. Now I want to make a letterbox list because I've watched yeah, lots of do. these movies where people kind of just walk <laughs> around and talk about life. Mm -hmm. Well, Seven Seal um, has a little bit more of a fantastical element to it, but right. Yeah. yeah. La Dolce Vita is Fellini, right? Is yes. Lenot Federico Truffaut? Fellini. Okay. <laughs> yes. Do you know who does Lenot? Is it Truffaut? Uh, I think it's his first name. I think is Michelangelo, but I don't remember what his last. Oh, um, no. Geneva, I'm totally I, Oh, Antonioni. My brain okay. is all over the place. Okay. La Not is not French. It's okay. Italian. And it's oh. La Note. <laughs> okay. Can I just say to the audience, I was up very late last night. I woke up 15 minutes before we started recording this podcast. I've eaten nothing. I'm very hungry. My brain is not, <laughs> not functioning <laughs> I mean, You're talking fully. about a movie I've never heard of. So, so La Note... La Note is a French. No, it's not. La Note is an Italian, Italian. film. Okay. La Dolce okay. Vita is also an Italian film. Oh, okay. Yeah. Antonioni, director of Blow Up. Okay. Got it. Okay. I will add that to my list. Thank yes. you. Highly recommend both of those movies. Um, I would say La Note is more so in the vein of this movie, but also they're both. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. Um, all that being said, I guess my. I, I don't really have any final takeaways from this movie other than it was nice to see another small indie movie. I just like watching small indie movies. Um, aside from that, I wasn't particularly invested in the movie. I probably won't watch it again. Um, but there were some funny one-liners that I thought were witty and clever. Um, and the friendship moment between Charlie and Tom was cute. But aside from that, that's that's kind of all I've got. So... You should definitely want, read some Jane Austen at some point, though. I, I mean, it's not it's not all this. <laughs> as much as I say that there's similarities, like for the sake of our friendship, I don't think I'm going to do that. Oh, okay, because Fair enough. <laughs> I, yeah, I, for just, the sake of our friendship, case. I'm not going to do that. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, it's okay if you read a little and don't like it. I actually had a friend recently watch Singing in the Rain, you know, as, which is, you know, is my first favorite movie for the first time. He gave it three stars on Letterboxd. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> but I wasn't offended. I was just like, I don't know how you come away from watching that movie and don't give it how? five stars, but all right. Different I mean, strokes for different stro- folks. <laughs> even if the ending is too long in my opinion it it is too long but even so that's not like a that doesn't that's the only thing about that movie where i'm like marks against it everything else i'm like it's perfect but that doesn't take it minimum four and a half stars stars. like Like, come on (laughs) we should bring that person on the podcast for us i know explain yourself (laughs) explain yourself yeah well i asked him about it and he's just like i wish i knew more about that era and so i could just i think he's just not as super well versed in 1950s musicals and he's just like I feel like there's a lot of stuff I wasn't getting and that I couldn't really enter into the movie I was like I don't I don't know what there is not to get but all right I'm not super (laughs) into 1950s musicals and I got it so yeah but I mean not to insult your friend but that's just so interesting yeah yeah strange yeah like I said I I wasn't offended I was just like huh that's that's interesting how how differently <laughs> you're you're a lot more gracious things. than I am if someone gave Lord of the Rings three stars I oh my gosh it'd be a problem <laughs> they would be dead to even, <laughs> even if someone gives it like four and a half stars I'm like I'm pretty sure I can never talk to you oh my gosh <laughs> um like there are no mm-hmm. You have, there are no complaints that you have that are valid. I'm sorry. Like, yeah. you're just wrong. You're, <laughs> you're wrong. just incorrect. <laughs> yeah. You, I don't you're, care. you can sit there in your incorrectness. I don't care if I lose friendships. I don't care if we lose <laughs> podcast listeners. I don't, I'm like, if you don't think that these movies are perfect, <laughs> you're not welcome in my life. Um, All right. Well, anyway, <laughs> quickly pull up Lord of the Rings on my uh, letterbox. Make sure I gave them all. Five oh, I've, stars. I've checked. You've given them five stars. Oh, okay. That's good. <laughs> We would have had a conversation if you'd given the four and a half. Um, oh my gosh. Anyway, right. so speaking of yeah. another mm-hmm. movie that is five stars, and if you don't rate it five stars, I wouldn't, you wouldn't not be allowed in my life, but I would be genuinely. Okay. Cur- you would think less of me. I would, I would be confused if someone didn't like this. I mean, you don't have to give it five stars, but it's like, if you give it three, hmm, what's going on there? Um, so yeah, next week is yes. um, to any of our consistent listeners <laughs> the few that we have. <laughs> it will be representing our one year anniversary of podcast episodes, Woo. or one ca- a one year anniversary of our podcast in general. Um, I think I'll schedule out some time in the episode specifically for us to talk a little bit more about that um, and whether or not we thought that our podcast would even last <laughs> this long. Um, but. Yeah, I have picked for us to discuss a movie that is um, a favorite to both Geneva and myself. Um, It's a recent film. It came out in 2021. It is David Lowry's A24. I mean, he's done several films with A24. But it is David Lowry's, um, another collaboration he has with A24. It's called The Green Knight. Um, Unfortunately... Not many people have seen this movie, which I think is very Insane. sad. Um, Ridiculous. Disgraceful. It's, Get on it, people. <laughs> it's a phenomenal <laughs> film. I highly recommend if you haven't seen it, please watch it and come back next week um, to listen because it, it's a phenomenal film and uh, it deserves to be seen more. So, um, yeah, that'll be a special celebration for us for our one year anniversary to just talk about a movie that we both love. Um I'm so freaking excited to rewatch this movie and talk about it. Yeah, it's going to be super fun. I'm pumped. So, um, yeah, stick around for that. Um, Happy New Year, everybody. Um, Yeah, Happy New Year. You know, have fun. Let loose. Be safe out there. All of the things. You get caught in any socialite after parties. Try and make sure that it's the good kind of pretentious people and not the bad kind of (laughs) annoying pretentious people. Be careful of the crazy drivers on the road, all of that jazz. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, thanks for sticking around with us for this year. And uh, we will talk to you in the new year. January. In the new year. We're in 2024. Yeah. How? Oh my gosh. How? <clears throat> Tatum, how did we get so old? You know, I ask myself this every day. <laughs> And I have no answer. <laughs> it's a mystery. All right. Thanks, everybody. We've been friends for like seven years. Can you believe oh that? <laughs> uh, 
Oh, okay. Anyway. Uh, cool. Do you ever just think about that moment in Gilmore Girls where um, L- Rory like introduces, I think it's like Jess and Logan to each other. And he's like, she's like, this is my old friend. I love getting to the age where I can call people an old friend. <laughs> and I'm like, Rory, you're like 20. <laughs> yeah. You also anyway. don't have many friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Anyway, come back next week. Uh, it's, yeah, I'm, it's gonna I'm be a good super one. pumped. I also be prepared for next week, guys. It might be a long episode. I, I have a gut feeling it might be a long episode. So, yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at yourpickpod at gmail.com. Our theme song was composed by Joel Rushton, and our podcast graphic was designed by Kara Shin. If you like this show and want to hear more, please rate and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're excited to have you on this journey with us. Until next time. Thank you.